Thank you for attending today's webcast, Open Source, IBM I and the Modern World with Tim Rowe. My name is Lacey Lukasiewicz. I am Commons Conference and Expo Coordinator. I will appear on your screen as the webcast host. If you have any technical issues, just send me a note using the chat box, which you'll find on the right side of your screen. If you'd like to send any written questions during the presentation, use the Q&A box, which is also on the right side of your screen. Tim will answer any of your questions that you have at the end of the presentation during the Q&A segment. Um, with that being said, let me introduce you to Tim. Tim Rowe has been working, with, working on the IBM I platform for 20 plus years. He is the business architect for application development and systems management and evangelist for modernization on IBM I. He is responsible for ensuring we have the right stuff built into the IBM I operating system to ensure we are able to meet the business demands of our applications today and into the future. Tim, if you want to go ahead and begin. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so today I'm going to spend some time just giving you an introduction to what we've been doing here in the development lab surrounding open source and why I care. Um, Tim, can you go ahead and share your screen? Free to ask questions at any point. I'm not sharing my screen. Yeah, if you can go ahead, go, go I, ahead and share your screen. I, sorry, I thought I had done that already. You disconnected and then, is that better? Yep, here you go. Great. There you go. So sorry. Okay. Now that we're sharing uh, the screen and we can uh, carry on. So when we talk about open source on IBM I, there's a couple different um, things we're going to kind of dig into. Talk a little bit about, you know, what is open source? Just kind of give a high level overview of what that really is all about. And then kind of some stuff about, about what we're doing here from a development perspective and how you can start to take advantage of these open source initiatives um, for our IBM I. First off, what is open source? You know, open source, it's a term um, that's used uh, in many respects, it's probably overused, but nonetheless, of course, our friends from Wikipedia give us lovely um, definitions for things, and here's what they've defined open source to be. Um, a computer, so computer software that's made freely available through some kind of a license, which a copy holder provides the rights to study, change, distribute, use this software for pretty much anyone for any purpose. And then it's often built in, in the public collaborative manner. So it's built by the community. Um, it's really kind of a fascinating process, open source. Um, it's really kind of taken off in many respects over the last five to ten years. We've seen really kind of an explosion in the open source space where there are lots and lots of uh, things available in this open source world to help us with our um, applications, help us with um, lots of different things to make our, our world better and make our business um, applications work, work as good as possible. Okay. Do you not have any audio right now? Tim, go, go ahead. I'll, I'll handle the audio. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, Wanted to make certain I happened to pop the see the chat coming up. So open source, especially I'm going to kind of look at it from the lens of the IBM I world. Looking at open source is kind of a, a, a key initiative. It has lots of different components and, and areas. Uh, this is just a list of some of the ones, not all of these, but probably about 80% of these. They actually all run on IBM I today. And so we're going to continue to dive into kind of what those are and, and why we care. So in many respects, open source is really a lot about um, 
in some ways a popularity contest, really. There's lots and lots of languages. Many of the languages that are in the world today are technically um, from the open source side of the world. Um, RPG, for example, you know, that's certainly not open source. That's a language that's proprietary. Uh, it's owned by the IBMI development team. Um, the cool part of that is, you know, we've been able to make changes to that and continue to evolve it um, versus languages like COBOL, which are pr primarily owned by um, some form of a standard. Or even languages like Java, which really are owned by Oracle today. Um, and we've seen a lot of changes in how the world of Java is dealt with um, now versus what it once was when it was owned by Sun. You know, and Oracle does what it wants to do in, in some respects. Other languages, Python, Ruby, JavaScript, PHP, Perl, these are languages that are open source communities. The community has a say in what what it does, how they're created, how they're dealt with, um, how they're updated, lots of different things in that space from um, the community takes and deals with. So it's, it's really a fascinating process. And so if you look at these different languages, especially in the light of applications today, applications today really are no longer ever a single language solution. Any application that you write is going to require you to leverage the right language, the right ecosystem for what you're trying to accomplish. And that's really what we're trying to do here on IBM I as well. Make certain that we have all the right languages, the right ecosystems, so that we can continue to have the interactions that we need for our, our business applications in today's world. So I found these just sort of an interesting um, little list of things. Um, I got these lists of different websites that are fairly popular from around the world. And you can see what type of languages these websites are being built on today. You know, you can see a bunch of them are built on PHP. There are a bunch of them that are using Python or Ruby or Perl. So, you know, these different types of open source and modern languages are very popular in, in today's world and are being widely used um, in the industry. And so we need to ensure that our IBMI community can do that. And when we think about our IBMI community, many of us are kind of at a crossroads um, in many respects. You know, we've, we have our core applications. They've been running an RPG for, you know, long, long time. Uh, argu arguably running quite well for many years. Um, we have our core business, our core business rules, we have our batch workload processing, works great, does good stuff, but we have this little black thing, this little black wart that sits on the top, it's called our user interface. What are we doing with it? Where are we going with it? Um, how can we interact with our users in today's world with today's means? And this is one of the key things that open source really has been helping us address and bring to the table is solving that particular problem. So as we go forward with open source, what are our options, right? Well, we've had things like Java, we've had .NET. Um, those those uh, options have been around for qu quite some time. And I've got, you know, many, many customers that have been very successful with either of those types of solutions. Well, about eight years ago, we really started to dive into this open source world, and that's where we started to deliver things like PHP with our relationship with Zend. And that's been fantastic, especially for our IBM I development community. I've got many customers that have created UIs with PHP. But like anything, one size does not fit all. And there's lots of different reasons that you may be more interested, you may be more inclined to use other types of technology. And so we've kind of explored and, and have been delivering over the past couple of years other open source components, much like you see here. We've been delivering Ruby and Python, Node.js, 
and there's others that are on this list that are now able to be easily connected into our RPG applications and still keep our business logic and our batch and all those other kind of things where they belong and our tight integration with our data and our database. So just interesting question. We've been on this open source path for actually quite some time now. Um, our very first project that we did in the world of open source, got any guesses? Obviously, I can't hear your answers, but you might have some thoughts and guesses, but the answer to that is our Apache server. The Apache server, we actually delivered that in like uh, Apache 2.0, was delivered in March of 2002. And that was the real first significant open source project that we undertook and delivered on our box. And we've been playing more and more in this space over the years. You know, we continue to deliver things like Samba, OpenSSL, OpenSSH. They've been on the, are available for quite a while. Um, one of our most successful projects was our Zen support. So let's look a minute and step back at why do we really want to do this? Why is this open source stuff really important? Um, and why should we on I be thinking about and considering this? And one of the questions that I get asked, you know, kind of revolves around this first statement here. You know, it's, it's what the industry in, a, in general is doing. And it really sort of comes around to the idea of I'm trying to find developers, I'm trying to find my workforce, you know, and I want to leverage the workforce that I have available to me. Well, this is what the workforce today, in many respects, is knows and has been doing. So it also is a major um, contributor from a community perspective. We can actually do a lot more if we don't have to do everything ourselves. And that's something that is very important from my perspective. You know, I mean, I have a fairly large development team that I work with and helps do a lot of stuff on the IBM I um, front. But, you know, even us, we have limited resources as to what we can do. And if I can leverage a massive user community to deliver significant value for my IBM I customers, that's incredibly appealing and can then be translated into helping our customers accelerate their progress as well. We can talk about training and education. You know, we pull in somebody, we hire somebody, we got to train them. They need to know how to do all this stuff. Well, how do you train them? In the past, years ago, you know, you, you went and hired a training company and they came in and you spent a whole bunch of money. Well, none of us have those kind of budgets that we maybe thought we did years ago. And so the world's changing and, and, and transforming. Well, there's tons of training and there's tons of education, even on Open Source on I. There's a number of different forums that are updated and, um, by the community talking about how they've been doing things and their experiences, which are tons of educational um, information that's available. Another reason why the industry is moving towards open source, it works. Uh, it's really that simple. When you can drive significant business by attacking things from a different viewpoint and be able to create user interfaces that allow that to happen, it can be quite transform transforming. Talk about cost. I I've covered this lightly already. I can't build everything. And if I can deliver stuff that is created by the community, it's cost effective. So significant benefits for doing some of these open source um, initiatives. Now, that's generally why we want to do it. What about why are we doing it on IBM I itself? Um, why not just stack up a Linux partition or throw it on a x86 Windows server and do my connectivity back and forth from there? Um, why do I care about doing it on my IBM I? Um, you know, we've been talking about modernizing our platform for a while. Uh, it's one of the things I spend quite a bit of time on. 
This one here can be rather attractive. You know, when we talk about um, security, we talk about ensuring things are safe and um, not being hackable, not giving up our private data. Um, do, the tools that open source bring you can can really be very attractive in doing that opening up to the, the world, but then you run the risk of how do I not expose things properly? Well, IBM I is an incredibly safe place to run open source software, especially, and now this is obviously the key, you know, we've talked about, you know, this has been talked about by others many, many times, um, IBM I is the most securable platform around, or one of the most securable. You, you can argue Z is just as securable, but you need to make certain that you're practicing safe security practices, even in doing it in open source. I mean, one of the, the best things about the IBM I architecture is if I'm going to stack up a PHP runtime or a Perl runtime, I'm, I'm creating a job. I got a process out there. That process is running under a particular user ID and password. And, and that has got a fundamental object level security built right into that that ensures some level of safety um, right there. And as long as you're practicing safe application programming, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be in very, in very good stead. It also can help simplify your overall infrastructure. You know, you have one system that you need to back up recover, maintain, provide high availability, and provide security for. Um, not having to have multiple different technologies, multiple different teams that are doing some of these things. And then there's this whole idea of being able to truly integrate together the data, the business logic, and the new UI and languages into this you know, brand new type of application, this new way of doing things, and having those um, together provide some benefits versus having things in remote locations. Additionally, and this is one of the complaints that I've heard from many of my IBM I customers over the years, is, well, I can't use open source. Because it's, you know, if I have a problem, if something goes wrong, I don't have service, um, it's not safe, it's not this, it's not that. Well, as soon as IBM delivers it and delivers it in a packaged manner, those rules of, well, I can't touch it because it's open source, tend to be relaxed and my customers now have avail availability to actually leverage this. And the beauty is there's little that you have to do for that particular ecosystem. If I want to use Python, I put on the LPP in that case, an LPO, I put it on, and if I have a problem, I can call my IBM I service folks, and they can help me work through things. And so it's integrated. That's one of the real values for us doing it from an operating system perspective. It also allows you to run things on your enterprise platform where you run your business. Um, key things that our customers really do care about. Of course, all talked about all the good stuff. Let's let's look at, you know, full disclosure here. Why should I not be doing open source? You know, there are real concerns. There is going to be a cost. Um, anytime you make changes, right, you have to deal with a cost. Um, in theory, it's not, even though we're providing it from an IBM perspective, it's not truly as integrated as some of the other things like RPG and DB2 are on the platform. Um, and it never can be due to the, you know, the technology in general. Um, there are people who question, are these open source projects, are they enterprise ready? Uh, many are, there, there are probably some that I would say are not. That could be a concern. Again, you've added change, you've added complexity. Your IT ecosystem needs to be able to deal with that. Compared to managing your applications on an IBM I from years gone past where I have my 5250, my RPG, my database, all in one simple nice package, that's ridiculously easy to manage. 
As soon as I put on any type of modern UI, I've added complexity. I've added difficulty to the managing, right? But again, you have to make that decision and understand the business value of creating a new UI, creating a new front end, leveraging these open source um, activities and the value and benefit that they can bring, does that offset this additional cost? I would obviously argue, yes, it absolutely does, but it's something that you need to understand. Um, we talk about skills. You may or may not have skills today, but if you're hiring new, any new skills, I guarantee you, you probably then will have these skills in these new employees. And then there's the real scary one, right? We hear stuff in the news. We've heard it all the time. Open source stuff can be unsecure. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we've, we've got a couple that hit, hit the news Cast. CNN had lots of fun with Heartbleed and Poodle and Shell Shock and you know social media has really kind of hyped up some of these. You know, you go back about three years ago, there were security vulnerabilities that were out there in certain of these software that were far worse than anything that Poodle or Heartbleed could um, bring to the table. Never heard about those because social media wasn't quite as uh, pro prominent as it is today, and so. These are things, they're real security concerns, absolutely. And they're things that you need to go in with your eyes open and you need to understand so that you can make certain that you deal with um, accordingly. Okay, enough of the general stuff. Let's kind of dive in a little bit to, you know, what are we doing on IBMI specifically? What are the areas that we've been investing in? How are we leveraging open source on IBMI? and helping making it available to our customers. Okay, first off, the one that's been there the longest, PHP. Um, we've provided the PHP ecosystem on our platform. We've had it there for um, eight years now, and we've done it with a partnership with Zend. Um, when we look at how I've delivered open source on I, we've really kind of taken three different approaches, or uh, yeah, Two, I'm sorry, two different approaches to, to this. I take that back. It is three different approaches. It's one is the ISVs, right? We've partnered with Zen. They've delivered PHP. We've worked with them to make certain that this PHP engine runs really, really good on I. And that's been a lot of fun. We've had great success with it. It's provided this entire ecosystem now that I can use to run other software, and that's one of the huge benefits for having these open source and on the box. Specifically, PHP allows us to run Sugar CRM and Magento and you know WordPress and others right here. Run them on I, unchanged. It's kind of a cool story. Um, that's been successful, working with that type of a partner to do that. Um, one of the other ways that we've been delivering open source is, you know, I, my team has gone and grabbed the binaries, done, done the uh, compilations, integrated it, and delivered it as part of an LPP. The last way is, you know, some of these open source technologies have been available on I for a while through more of an open source, true open source methodology. Whether it's um, somebody who cares and wants to go play, has got it out there hosted on a website. I've got a lot of customers that have done the work themselves to do the, comp the compiling and getting it running on I, and they're using it today uh, quite successfully. So with you know this type of open source in, in PHP in this particular example, um, it, it really is, much the same, you know, you write some form of a new UI that interacts with your RPG, it interacts with your database, um, and you have options and choices whether you want to have it to be only that UI or part of your um, having both still available to you. With Zend, one of the cool things with because of the partnership, we actually deliver PHP with the box. So when you order a new IBMI through manufacturing, you will get a copy of the PHP server. Um, you are entitled to the um, Zen server for every IBMI license 
that you've purchased, and this includes 7.1, I need to update this slide for 7.2, um, is also there, and you get one year of support. Um, all part of your IBMI operating system license that you purchased. So it's kind of your entitlement. You also get access to the studio as well as Zen DBI. Zen DBI is kind of a key piece of this, is we partner with Zen and, and they're the guys that actually have delivered the MySQL database engine for IBMI. A number of years ago, we actually were able to uh, create and host and put that out onto the um, MySQL website, and that was all fine and well until Oracle decided to kick all the um, blue database connectors um, out of the pool, which included ours. And so we needed a new place to, to put this, and so Zen stepped up and now would deliver the MySQL engine for IBM I. Then, then the really cool part is this magic piece, that very last bullet, and that's the DB2 storage engine. The storage engine allows you to interact between MySQL and DB2 for I, which means that if I have an application that happened to have been written with MySQL, and I want to run that on my IBM I, it doesn't mean that all my data has to be stored in a MySQL database. By leveraging the implementation, the application can talk as if it's talking to a MySQL database, but the real magic is the storage engine will take and transfer that real data back to your IBM IDB2. So now you're back into the good old-fashioned IBM DB2 where you can continue to manage and deal with all of your normal DB2 for I stuff, yet your application doesn't know any better. It's a really slick solution. And so if you have applications, whether it's PHP or other open source that needs MySQL, this is where you get it from, is through this Zen DBI component. Lots of customers that are doing this. This is just a, a, a smattering of, of some that have had great success using PHP on our platform in production type environments. Well, one of the other new ways that we've been doing this, and this is with you know my team here at the development lab, is we've been going and creating new open source technologies and, and delivering it to our customers. Well, the Apache server, we've delivered that through our DG1 product, um, and we had some thoughts that maybe that was a decent landing place to put other open source products. Um, but after having some conversations with our uh, very conservative IBM legal team, we came up with an alternative solution that I think really kind of fits the bill qu quite well and will really be beneficial both for the ease of us in development here at IBM to deliver these and the ability for our consumers, our users, to be able to get access to these in a, a simple and safe manner. So, we created a new license program option, 5733 OPS, it stands our open source product, and it is strictly and solely designed to give us a vehicle for delivering these open source technologies on IBM I. That's what it's there for. We actually created this product with a whole bunch of options. I don't know, I think there's like 18 options. They're not very well named because we don't know what all of them are going to be at this point. You know, but they say something like option one or option two, uh, very informative. Option three, again, just spot on as being able to clearly tell you what that is. Uh, just kidding. Um, but once we have that product there, through then simple PTF deliveries, we're able to now deliver things like Node.js or Python or Perl or other types of these open source technologies that our customers really want and, and need. And it really does provide a very simple, easy way to do that. Um, it also protects the IBM operating system from some of these open source technologies because it, it, it separates the dependencies between um, open source and the OS, which makes our IBM legal team very happy. One of the key things that we've also done when we've been looking at these open source technologies is it's one thing for us to provide the runtime. So either Node.js, Python, 
it's one thing for us to take, compile it, deliver it. I mean, there's value to that, yes. But as you know, we are IBM I, I stands for integrated. So you know, we took a little step back and said, okay, not only do we want to deliver the language, deliver the ecosystem, we want to make it consumable. And we want to make it consumable for our I family. And so there's really three different areas that come into play there that are important for this integration. First, we've been making certain that we've been able to connect everything through with FastCGI. FastCGI allows us to have that connection from the open source container to our IBM HTTP Apache server. And it gives us that pipe between the two worlds so that we can have a very fast connection when you come in from the web and you can tunnel across, still taking advantage of all your normal IBM I HTTP server uh, capabilities, being able to leverage that all on your I. And that fast CGI is a key, key component to that. Well, when I'm in Python, when I'm in Node, just like when I'm in Java, I need to be able to access content that's on the ILE or the native world. You know, in the world of Java, we've had the Java toolbox. And if I'm in Java, whether I'm in Java on the box or I'm in Java off the box, and I need to access an RPG program, a data queue, a message area, a system value, a user profile, I need to connect to some database information, get access to DB2 info. There's ways that are provided to allow us to do that, whether it's a JDBC connector for the database or if it's the Java toolbox. And so those mechanisms have been there. When we moved into PHP and now these other languages, we needed to also have great mechanisms to allow us to get at that same data. It doesn't do us any good to have this open source language available if you can't get at the data, if you can't connect to your applications. And so the two areas that we focused on in there is providing an ILE toolkit for each of these environments. So you can connect in a node-like manner within Node.js and access ILE data. Same with Python, same with PHP. There's these toolkits that are available to help you access ILE information. Additionally, we have DB2 connectors that allow you to easily transfer data to and from your DB2 for I. So these are key technologies that we've then built into each of these deliveries that we've gone out with. One of the key technologies that that's built on is something called XML service. Um, much like our Java toolbox world, there's servers that sit on the IDMI, and their job is to just sit there and listen for requests to come in. When a request comes in, whether it's they then parse the request, process the request, call off to the actual object that you asked for, and return information back. Normal stuff. And XML services, the a technology that we created um, that is designed to do that, but to do it in a language independent manner. It leverages XML today um, as its um, way to define what you're requesting and what's being returned, but it truly can be called from anywhere. Um, it can be called from a process on the box. It can be called from a process off the box. It can be called from any other language. Um, we have people that are calling it an RPG to go request information from another uh, system. You can be called from Java, Perl, PHP, XML, it doesn't matter. It's a truly language neutral uh, technology. So that's kind of the engine that runs underneath for all of this um, interaction between the native side, the ILE, IBM I native information and these different open source technologies. So the new kits. Let's kind of talk about some of the new things that we've been doing. These are all um, items that have been done in the last uh, two years um, 
especially over the last year, many of these are, are very, very new. First off, Ruby. Ruby on Rails, something that we partnered with our friends from the PowerRuby.org group um, to deliver a truly fantastic Ruby on Rails engine for IBM I. Ruby is a very interesting framework. It's a web framework built on the, the Rails. Rails is a web framework that's built on the Ruby language is really what that's about. Ruby itself is the actual language. Rails is really the magic that makes it interesting. It's something that's very easy to learn for many, many developers. Um, and the really cool thing is it's got a very large open source community. That open source community have created gems. Gems are basically packages that do things for you, that extend the web framework so that it really is designed to allow you to focus on creating your application, not coding infrastructure for the application. And so the framework is what really simplifies and provides this great ability for prototypes and actually um, application delivery. So Ruby was really kind of designed to kind of be the best of both worlds, provide some of the best dynamic language concepts and static language concepts while blending them into kind of an object-oriented um, uh, format. So for some developers, it's just a super um, option. I talked about, you know, our partnership. Power Ruby is the group that has done this. If you need more information, the powerruby.com is where you can go. They have got a uh, free version that's out there and available today. Um, you can go download that. It works fantastic on IBMI. I know they are in the process and I have not seen if it's available quite yet. They're also going to be delivering an enterprise version. Um, which provides a whole bunch more additional bells and whistles. It provides some um, faster integration with the database connectors and some, um, uh, some, some tighter integration on IBM I itself um, that can be used to really create very powerful and fast um, web um, applications on IBM I. So we're really excited about this. Um, uh, new support as well. And I know we've got a number of people that are um, leveraging it and a number that have actually even uh, gone production with this particular technology. Now, from the IBM I side of the house, we recently, we delivered Node.js, we delivered that in December of uh, last year, so December of 2014. It came out, so it's been less than a year. And um, this is kind of a cool story because what we've done is the IBM the bigger IBM world, they've gone and grabbed a copy of Node.js and they've been working on making changes to Node such that it can take, the, take advantage of the power processor chip. And so they've been going and updating that to make certain that Node works super well on the power chip and, t and trying to take advantage of the power technology itself. And so what we've done is we've taken that IBM Power Technology version, and we've made a couple minor tweaks to ensure that it runs well on IBM I, and that's actually what we're delivering in option one of 5733 OPS. So this is the first delivery in this new open source um, LPO that we created. It's really, Node is really kind of a game changer in many ways. In the world of web technology, um, we've truly been sort of a, a static type of situation for, for quite a while where there's, you know, one-way communication. I send a request, I get back information. Well, the thing about Node, which is really interesting, is it's, it, it helps, it, it allows us to possibly change the paradigm where we can have some two-way traffic going back and forth. We can have applications that talk on a continuous basis to the back-end server. Node is the JavaScript runtime engine that's in the Google Chrome uh, browser. JavaScript today is all about asynchronous transactions, being able to asynchronously 
send information back in an incredibly high-performing manner. And Node does it very well, except that as opposed to making the engine run on the browser, I've got an engine now that runs on the server. Cool thing about Node is it's JavaScript. And so from a language and skills perspective, lots of people no one understand JavaScript. And so there's a lot of synergy there. It's also becoming increasingly popular, and there's lots and lots of extensions that can be added into Node to help build your application. So it's kind of an exciting new project. We've delivered the key extensions that we've talked about from an integration perspective. We have the fast CGI built, stuff built in. We have a toolkit built into Node that allows you to access all sorts of native objects but do it in a way that's a little bit more native to Node.js. It's going to take care of creating the XML strings for you under the covers and being able to do and doing that transformation and transactions back and forth for you. Um, so exciting stuff from a Node perspective. Um, you know, recently there's been a ton of interest out on the forums. I know I've got a bunch of people around the world right now that are really exploring Node, working on creating applications. Some are getting ready to go production here very soon. So it's a very exciting um, time in this open source world, especially around the world of Node. Just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about from this, how things are laid out. If you look at the picture over on the right, we have our Node.js core. It has connectors built into it to go off to the DB2 or the at Node Toolkit, it's using our, either our XML service or DB2 for I, CLI information to actually then get at that native IVMI content um, and does it in a very seamless manner for you. The other new one that just came out is Python. Python was delivered in June of this year. It's in a very popular uh, language. It's kind of considered, from, from the IBMI side of the world, it's kind of considered the um, CL language of the open source world. And there's, a, again, a large web community. It's been around for a while. It's incredibly versatile. I can do web stuff. I can do scripting things. The cool part about Python, and, and one of the reasons we delivered it was, in order for us to build the Node.js delivery that we delivered in December, we needed to have Python running on I in order to do that build and to get things working properly. So we grabbed Python, compiled it, lo and behold, it worked perfectly. And so we decided, oh, let's deliver that. And, and so that's one of the reasons that you know, we, get it. we needed it. So let's get it available to our community because in order to add all of those additional packages into Node, you need to use Python to enable that to happen. So it's a very complementary language, fast, lightweight, very popular, um, and uh, continuing to uh, really grow um, in the marketplace. Um, the other new one that we've been working on this fall, GCC. How do you compile things in the open source world? Um, on IBM I, we've had the XLC compiler. It's our C, C++ compiler. Been there for a while. Truly customized to take advantage of the power processor chips. Um, but it's the IBM I compiler. It's the IBM compiler. Um, does a very good job if you're creating native C code. But in the open source world, GCC is the compiler of choice in that particular world. And one of the big inhibitors that many of our um, IBM I cut users had to deal with for years in trying to deal with open source was they would grab an open source package, Python, they would pull it over to IBM I, they would take the XLC compiler and compile it, and then it wouldn't work properly. And that's because the XLC compiler does things differently. Well. For us, when we delivered Node or delivered Python, we actually are compiling it with GCC. So again, we needed it, we're using it, 
let's make it available to our users. And so option three of our 5733 OPS product, um, and that should be out here very soon this year, um, it's scheduled to be done before the end of the year, is to deliver this compilation of compilers and tools to help our open source developers do their job. Now, this package that we're delivering in option three, it's a little different than what we've delivered in some of the other options already. When you get Node or you get Python, we are actually delivering the compiled binaries to you and you get them and you're done. Well, in this GCC collection, this GNU compiler, we're not only delivering just the compiler, we're also delivering this entire ecosystem, this open source development ecosystem. And you can see we've got a pile of things that are thrown in here. You get a whole bunch of shell scripts. I get bash, I get curl, I have Perl. I've got all these different things that are built into that that are all important and and used by the open source developer in their tool belt. These are the things that they care about. Uh, they may care about more, but this is certainly a good starting point. So what we've done, as opposed to take all of these things, compile them, and deliver the binaries to you, we decided to, to take a little bit of a different approach. All of these components are already out in the open source community today available. Most people just don't know where they are or what package they need to grab to make it work. So we created some scripts. These, the script is what's going to be delivered in option three. The script's going to go out to um, primarily the perzel.org, uh, P-E-R-Z-E-L, perzel.org website, where these packages are already compiled for AIX, which is the foundation of what PACE is, which is what these things will run in. We figured out the right packages that work. We're going to download them for you, put them onto Paste, put them into your IBM I, and you will now have this open source development environment ready for you to use so that you can do your own open source development. Um, either leveraging on what we have today, extending what we have today, or going off and grabbing the next cool thing that you need um, to build your next application. So we're rather excited about this. Um, uh, and it, it's quite, quite. Um, we've actually had it out in beta for several months now, um, and we've made some refinements, and it's actually going, and we're very, very excited about this new offering. So one of the things that we've done additionally is partnered with Common. Um, the partnership with Common is we cre created a new open source forum. It's a IBM I forum, new open source technology languages that's going to be held in December of this year where we've got some industry experts as well as some guys from IBM coming to talk about Node.js, Python, and Ruby on Rails. And so Kevin Adler is one of the key guys on my team. He's been doing open source since he was a young lad over in college. Oh, he is still a young lad, but nonetheless, he's been on our platform since 2009, been doing open source um, for quite a few years prior to that. He was one of the key builders and deliverers of the Python engines that we have on I today, and so he's going to be speaking on Python. Um, and I didn't, I didn't change that right. The second one is not Kevin Adler. That is actually Pete Helgren. Sorry, Pete, for not changing your name. Um, he's going to be talking about Ruby on Rails. And then we got our friend Aaron Bartell, who's incredibly passionate about these. And he'll be going to be coming in there, and he's going to be talking about Node.js. And so they're going to talk about open source in general, how to compile it, how to use version control. They're going to dig into each of these languages and talk about what it is and how to connect with DB2, how to connect RPG programs building your own applications. And so it's going to be a pretty exciting event um, to really dive into these new languages. Um, information is all there out on the common website. Great opportunity to 
to go much deeper than what you're going to be able to from a webcast. This is a two-day event where you've got the experts, they're there, you can ask them questions, you can sit down side by side, make a whole bunch of progress. Um, really excited about this particular event and the potential that it brings um, to our IBMI community um, as a whole. So that's primarily what I have to talk about today. I see I have a couple of questions. Um, one quick question I see is Tomcat was mentioned. Yeah, Tomcat's actually one of those open source technologies that IBM delivered Tomcat once upon a time, and we actually had a version of Tomcat that ran on IBM I, um, worked just fine. But in that world, when we talk about web serving, um, I had to be a little careful because I have to deal with the IBM web people, and that's the web world of WebSphere. And then as it turned out, Tomcat's one of those beautiful open source technologies that works. I go to the Tomcat website, I grab the Tomcat container, I drop it into Pace, I set my Java home, and I start it. Done. I need to do nothing else. So there's really nothing that IBM needs to do for Tomcat to work. So when you ask about what version of Tomcat supported, it's really dependent upon the version of Java that Tomcat requires. And if that version of Java is running on the IBM I um, version that you're currently on. So basically, all versions, are, all versions work. Again, though, the one downside to Tomcat is if you have issues or problems, you need to go post to the Tomcat forum. There's no IBM internal support. So I don't know if there's any other open source type questions. I see there's a couple other questions. Um, I'll let uh, our wonderful host answer those. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. Um, the event is recorded, so it will be posted to the Common website so everyone knows. Um, if there's any more questions, if you could get those in now, I'll give it a couple seconds here. You can use the Q&A portion at the bottom right. Okay. It will be available for downloading uh, later on. It'll be posted to the website by the end of the day. So, all right, with that being said, thank you so much, Tim, for taking time out of your day to do this, and thank you, everyone, for attending. There will be a uh, evaluation that will pop up in your browser once the session is ended. If you could just take some time to fill that out just to give us some feedback, that would be great. Yeah, and, uh, if I can okay. just interrupt one more second. I, I just would really encourage you to, um, if you know of people that are interested in open source, point them at this conference. It'd be a fantastic event for them. Yes, absolutely. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. If you have any questions, you can always contact us through the information on our website. All right. Have a good day, Tim. Bye-bye. Thank you.